This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a customer and a salesman at a car showroom. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good morning. Please take a seat. How can I help you? Well, I'm thinking of buying a new car and I'd like some advice. Sure, yes. Had you got any particular make in mind? I'm interested in a leader. I've had one before and liked it, but I haven't really made up my mind. Sure. We've got various models. Um, right. What about the engine size? Any ideas? Uh, the one I've got at the moment's a 1.2 litre engine, but I find it a bit slow on long journeys. Mm. I'd like a bit more power this time. A 1.4 should do. I don't think I need a 1.6 or anything. Right. Well, I think the model you're looking at is the Max. Hmm. Here's a picture. Oh, Yes. Have you got one in? Yes. I'll take you to have a look at it in a minute. I'll just get a few more details. Uh, is there anything else to do with the engine? What kind of gear change do you want? I presume you want a manual. I'd want automatic. I've never driven a car with manual gears. Right. Well, now, here's the colour chart for the Max. Have you given that any thought? Oh, this blue's very popular at the moment. Yes, it is nice. I like blue. Um, what's it called? Royal? Yes. Hmm. But actually, I think I prefer this lighter shade here. Sky. Yes, that's popular too. I think I'll go for that. You might have to wait a week or so for that colour, but I assume that'll be OK. Oh, yes, fine. Well, we can go outside and you can have a good look at one and perhaps take it out. Mm. But first, can I just ask you about finance? The cash price is going to be somewhere in the region of seven and a half thousand. How would you like to pay? Are you in a position to pay cash or would you need credit? I'd like credit, provided the terms are reasonable. Well, you can discuss that with my colleague in a moment. We have various arrangements. And um, would you be interested in us taking your present car as part exchange? Yes. OK, fine. So I'll just need some details from you and then we can do a valuation. Is that OK? Fine, yes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Could I have your full name? Wendy Harries. That's H-A-R-R-I-E-S. And is that Mrs? Miss? Ms? It's Doctor, actually. Oh, right. And your address? 20 Green Banks. Is that green spelled as in the colour? Yes, that's right. OK. Alton. Is that O-L-T-O-N? Not quite. It begins with an A, not an O. Oh, yes. That's in Hampshire, isn't it? That's right. And do you know your postcode? Uh, yes, it's G-U-8-9-E-W. Do you have a daytime phone number? 
Well, I work at the hospital, but it's a bit difficult to get hold of me. I can give you a number just for messages, and then I'll get back to you when I can. Is that okay? That's fine. It's o seven nine eight two five seven six four three. Fine. And about the car you have now, what make is it? It's a Conti. Do you know the year or the model name? I think it's nineteen ninety six, and it's called a Lion, like the animal. Then it must be nineteen ninety four, because they brought out the Fox after that. Oh right, yes. Mileage, roughly. I'm not sure. I know it's less than seventy thousand. Okay. What colour is it? It's grey, metallic grey. Right. And one last thing. What sort of condition would you say it's in? I'd probably describe it as reasonable. Do you need to see it? It's parked outside. Not at the moment, no. Perhaps you could call in one day next week. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear an admissions officer from a UK university talking to a group of postgraduate students in a university abroad about applying for a place at his university. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. As I said earlier, there is, I think, at Rexford an excellent combination of physical and geographical advantages, as well as having a rural setting and still being close to central London. Something that will certainly be of interest to you is that Rexford is just thirty-five minutes from London Airport. At Rexford, we have a strong research capability. We came seventh out of a hundred and one universities in last year's research assessment, carried out by a government body, and did particularly well in your particular subjects: engineering and science. Actually, we got a top research grade of five for engineering, geography, and computer sciences. One further point. And I know from talking to you individually that a number of you may be looking for some experience in industry after the course. Is that all our science and engineering research departments have unusually close relationships with industry in the area? Anyway, that's enough sales talk from me. I'll just take a sip of this coffee that's just arrived. Thank you, and then I'll say something about what actually happens when you apply. Right now, if you do decide to make an application, what you do is send it directly to me in my department. I will then immediately send confirmation 
and the application process begins. And I'd like to say at this point that you shouldn't worry if this process doesn't work all that quickly. I mean, occasionally there are postal problems, but most often the hold-up is caused by references. The people you give as referees, shall we say, take their time to reply. Anyway, it's absolutely normal for this process to take three to four months. What I do in this period is keep in touch with you and reassure you that things are moving along. One of the ways we've devised to help you decide about applying, as well as later when you've been accepted, hopefully, is to put you in contact with, if possible, a student from your own country who is at present studying with us. What you can do is phone them up, we will of course liaise between you, and discuss your concerns with them. That way you can get an objective opinion of what you can expect if you come to live and study at Rexford. Not only the academic atmosphere, but important details like what the leisure facilities are like and whether the English weather and food are really as awful as everybody says. No. <laughs> if you decide you can face it, the contact can also help you just before you leave with tips on what to pack and that sort of thing. At the moment, I think we've got two second-year students and one postgraduate from this country. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now to move on to the other concerns you expressed earlier. At a UK university, as I'm sure you know, you will be in an environment where independent learning is the norm, which takes most students a while to adjust to, and at a time when you will be separated from your normal surroundings, and in most cases your family. This can be a difficult time, but remember that something like 25% of our student body are international students like yourselves, and that there are several organisations in the university and city whose main purpose is to offer help and ensure that your time with us is enjoyable and useful. One or two of you touched on the subject of accommodation earlier, so I'll just add a few points. It is the university's policy to give priority in the allocation of residence places to three categories, and those are visiting students, exchange students, and new postgraduate students. However, demand exceeds supply, so there is still a need to put your name down early for campus accommodation, particularly if your family is accompanying you. This means that the earlier you decide whether you want to study with us, and so get the procedure moving, the better it will be for everybody. Um, yes? Uh, what if you would prefer to live outside the university? If you're planning to live off campus, you've got to sort things out even earlier. As with everything in short supply, the good accommodation gets snapped up months before the beginning of term. In other words, if you're starting in October, you need to be thinking about it in June, or at the very latest July. So you do need to think very carefully about what you need, how much you can afford to pay well in advance. What you can't do is leave it until a few days before the start of term. The agencies in town are pretty good. It's just a matter of contacting them in good time. Of course, we have a full-time accommodation officer available to help all students. She'll get in touch with you when you're accepted. She's got plenty of contacts in the town and will deal with the agencies on your behalf. 
One or two of you asked me earlier about your level of spoken English. Obviously, most of you have already achieved a lot. I wish I could speak your language half as well. Having said that, though, I'm afraid the lecturers will make little or no allowance for the presence of non-native speakers in the audience. So, anything you can do to improve your spoken English, even beyond the pretty high levels most of you have already reached, will help make your stay with us that bit more fun for you. Some extra practice before you arrive is worth more than, for example, private lessons afterwards when you won't really have time. Oh, and one last thing before I invite further questions. It's very important. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two business studies students, Evelyn and Mark, preparing for a seminar presentation. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Well, I think the marketing of food would be a good topic. I read a very interesting article the other day about the Canadian food market. Hmm. I suppose everybody's interested in food, even if it's trying not to eat. Why Canada? I know that's where you come from, but isn't it just all North America, really? No. That's why I thought this article was interesting. Although lots of U.S. companies are well established in Canada, and vice versa, there are still subtle differences between the two markets. It says here, the Canadian market is definitely not a northern clone of the U.S. I like that. And it says that if you understand these differences, it can have a big impact on successful food marketing. So I know that Canada has a big French-speaking population in Quebec. Is this what they're referring to? Not only French and English speakers, there are many different ethnic groups in Canada. It's really quite multicultural. For example, Toronto has large Asian and Italian populations, and Vancouver's got a large Asian population too. And, because Canada's population is small, these groups make quite an impact, introducing new styles of cooking. So, you can see lots of unfamiliar vegetables and things in the markets, and new restaurants are opening every day. It's great if you love trying out new foods, as many people do. Which kinds of food are becoming popular? Well, some Asian food, I'd say, has been popular for quite a while, like Chinese. But now, Southeast Asian restaurants are becoming very fashionable. Then, there's Mediterranean, of course, such as Greek, Italian, and so on. But... Caribbean and Mexican food is really taking off among young people these days. So, are the supermarkets starting to stock the ingredients that are needed to prepare these foods at home? You know, all those unusual condiments and sauces. Yes, that's right. It's quite interesting going to the supermarket, isn't it? And noticing how they're introducing sections for foods of different nationalities. You can buy quite exotic products locally these days. The article mentioned that 80% of the Canadian retail market is controlled by eight major national supermarket chains. 
so that when they introduce changes, they can happen quite rapidly. OK. Well, how are we going to organise this seminar then? I made some notes on the trends in the Canadian market about changing tastes and also patterns for where food is consumed. I thought maybe we could summarise it into a chart or table and maybe use the overhead projector to present it. Good idea. Maybe I could have a look for similar trends and tastes in Australia and the UK for comparison. Let's have a look at what you found. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 26 to 30. The most significant trend, it seemed to me, was that Canadians are definitely interested in healthy food. For example, did you know that salads are the third most commonly eaten food in Canadian restaurants? Really? What about organic food then? Is that becoming more popular? Yes, it's definitely moving into the mainstream compared to a few years ago. And a recent survey showed that four out of five shoppers said that they check the fat and nutritional information on the packet when they're deciding what to buy. What other trends did you find out? There's one change I noticed straight away when I was home last year in the meat department. You know, here the meat packaging says rump steak or four-quarter chops and so on. Well, they discovered that most consumers these days didn't know what to do with these roasts and rounds and ribs. So the government approved a new naming system for cuts of meat, which is related to the required cooking technique. What a good idea. I've never really understood the difference between sirloin, rump, round and all those names. So how many new categories are there? Eight. There are three kinds of steak, for grilling, for marinating and for simmering. And then there's what they call quick serve beef, for stir fries I suppose. And premium oven roast, oven roast, pot roast and stewing beef. It's a great idea, isn't it? I hope it catches on here. I agree. Any other trends that you thought were significant? Well, what's really interesting is what the article called mobile meals. In other words, more and more Canadians are eating meals away from home, but not just eating more junk food. They're projecting a 40% increase in snack food sales over the next three years, and the growth is coming from healthy snacks. You know, the ones that have less cholesterol and fat, such as muesli bars, health food bars, and those types of products. Apparently, in the food marketing jargon, they're called nutritious portable foods, which means healthy snacks. The other major trend is that young people are doing more of the food shopping these days, so marketing has to be aimed more at them, as well as more conventionally at the mother. Thanks, Evelyn. I think we'll have an interesting discussion about these trends and the comparisons with other English-speaking countries. I'll see if I can get some information about them to compare with yours, and meet you on Friday to put it together. See you then. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three.
Part 4 You will hear a talk given by Dr Miranda James. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first in a series of talks we have arranged for the Overseas Students Association this semester. Dr. James has very kindly agreed to speak to us today on the topic of public speaking, and judging from the large numbers of you here, it's clearly a subject of great interest and relevance. Dr. James. Hello. It's good to see so many of you here, and hopefully what I'm going to tell you will be useful to you both here at the university and in your future employment. Many people avoid speaking publicly, by which I mean in front of, say, ten or more people. Not because they lack the ability, but mainly because they lack confidence which is really only due to lack of practice. Today, as a consequence of the influence of television, audiences expect speakers to be relatively brief and to the point, in addition to being well-informed and interesting or entertaining. Probably the most important part of public speaking is what you do beforehand by which I mean preparation. This includes practical details, such as knowing precisely what your topic is and exactly how long you are expected to talk for. You should also plan the content thoroughly. A good strategy is to write out the content as you intend to say it and then make brief notes preferably on small cards, which you use to talk from. This way you sound more natural. You incorporate pauses while you look at your notes, and you can then look at your audience while you are speaking. Never read your speech without looking at the audience. Eye contact is a very important part of communicating with an audience. So deliberately move your head and look around at your audience. Pauses are important, as most people, when they are nervous, tend to rush through their speech. Practice speaking slowly. This gives you more time to pronounce your words correctly. It's always easier for your audience to listen to someone whose speaking is clear and calmly paced so that they can understand the ideas being explained. And the bigger the group, the more slowly you should speak. Remember to project your voice, speaking clearly to the person furthest away from you. It's a good idea to rehearse and record yourself. Pay attention to your intonation when you listen to yourself. It's even harder if you're speaking in a second language, I would imagine. But there's nothing worse than listening to a flat, monotonous voice. So try to vary your tone and rhythm. This will add meaning to your words. Lastly, pay attention to both your posture and your gestures. A confident person stands or sits in a small group with their head up, chin out and shoulders back. 
Try to avoid scratching or fiddling with your hair or beard or pens, jewellery and so on. These movements can distract and irritate your audience. Yet you may be unaware of them yourself. Another reason for rehearsing, preferably with feedback from a friend, or better still, on video. I hope these few tips will make your experience of speaking in public a little easier. Remember, practice makes perfect. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.